Hey, Paisanos. So do you know what a basal fracture line is? I do. I, I learned about it in an interrogation video about a dead child. That was fun. Let's read Smash Fan Fiction. It comes out tomorrow. Why not? Sonic the Communist by S.C. After Sonic studies Marxism-Leninism, he's determined to turn subspace and each Smasher's universe into a communist paradise. Chapter 1. Arrival. I sighed as I put on my Ushanka, the revolutionary red star facing the front. I loved how I changed in the past few months, going from a mindless capitalist puppet to a revolutionary communist, all because I decided to open my mind and observe what really went on in the world. The world's full of bankers who launch warfare on other citizens just to make money. It's sick. Workers need to rise up and overthrow them. Tails was fully with me on embracing such a beautiful ideology, but I don't know where he is. Shadow, however, isn't, and that's why I turned him into a trophy. I don't need to deal with greedy capitalists on a daily basis. All they think about is money and exploiting people. Speaking of, I got invited to a greedy, disgusting meeting cap of capitalists at Subspace, chaired by five bourgeois. Masterhand, Bowser, Wario, Ganondorf, and Taboo. These five all bathe in their cash while everyone else starves. We need to overthrow them and set up a perfect communist utopia where everyone's equal. Although I condemn all forms of capitalism and pa private ownership, I'm going to it simply to spread my message. Before making my way to subspace, I grab my holy scriptures. The Communist Manifesto. I put on a Che Guevara shirt and slip on some black skin-tight jeans before I lower my gloves wristbands low enough that I can see the red and yellow hammer and sickle tattoos on my wrists. It's time to stop hiding the fact that I'm a proud Marxist. I press a button, resulting in my teleporting to subspace. There, I see Marth, Roy, and Ike. The Fire Emblem gang all stare at me. Wow, Ike said in a brainwashed puppet sort of way. So, you're a commie then, Sonic? I sure am, I explain revolutionarily as I do a fist pump in the air. <laughs> what a joke, Marth laughed fascistly. I give the misogynistic, Islamophobic, racist bigot the finger. Interesting, Roy stated in a way someone would if they wanted to learn more about the wonderful ideology of Marxism. Our planet doesn't allow that. Because your world's full of capitalist pigs who keep the proletariat dumbed down, I stated rebelliously. No, because communism is a bad ideology. It was formed by envy, Marth mansplained as I literally see coins in his greedy bourgeois eyes. You do not talk about communism like that. Communism helped get labor lives for the working class. Well, you greedy capitalists exploited us, I yelled feministly. Dear Lenin in heaven, how can people be this stupid? What about the Soviet Union and their abuses? Marth spits out his typical capitalist propaganda that a, Euro that, a bleh, that a bureaucracy of rich one percenters control. Only people against our revolutionary ideas went in the gulags, I said in a bold, socialist voice. You're a liar, Marth stated in a tone sympathetic to the imperious nature of satanic capitalism. Huh. I do support workers' rights, though, Roy stated in a wise, revolutionary voice. If that's what communism stands for, count me in. I grin as I gained a new comrade. Together, me and Roy can convert this den of brainwashed followers of bourgeois puppeteers to our cause. Then we can overthrow the establishment. All I know is Marth's on the wrong side of history. Watch out, Nazi, because communism is coming back. Still Just a Kid by Umu An. Snake realized that behind all that annoying ego and seemingly never-ending confidence, Sonic was still just a confused and a worried teenager who sometimes, despite his impressive heroism and bravery, still needs a helping hand to reach out and hold on to, even just for a little while. Chapter 1. Still Just a Kid Author's note, when I started writing this and had the general idea down, I later saw Scribble Hooves from Tumblr comic with a similar pattern, but with Peach instead. This is a mere coincidence, though I wouldn't lie that I based some elements from the said comic out of inspiration, not plagiarism. Having to fit over 70 people under one roof, the hands informed that this time, the Smash Brothers couldn't hold the privilege to own their very own bedroom, unlike in the past tournament seasons. Some, who should room with a close friend or family, didn't mind about the change, like Mario and Luigi and Ryu and Ken. 
Others complained about their assigned undesired roommate and the lack of privacy in the already crowded home of rowdy smashers, like the Three Kings, Bowser, DDD, and Ganondorf. Is Ganondorf a king? I, I mean, just technically. Some hand lines. Anyway. Solid Snake, plus several others, wondered why the infinitely powerful hand didn't simply enlarge the place as a solution to the supposedly minor problem, with a snap of their fingers like it's a regular Tuesday. Were they trying to promote a closer bond between the bitter ones? Because he's quite sure that was the reason when he had to share a bedroom with the one he dreaded the most. Sonic the Hedgehog! The said hedgehog's irritating attitude didn't change one bit since he left. Wasn't Sonic better fitted to room with someone who's maybe also younger and blue like Mega Man? Racist. Or someone who obliviously plays along with his little game of teasing like Pit. Did the hands really believe him and Sonic still hadn't gotten along well? Excuse them. Long ago, Snake mastered the way to tolerate Sonic's antics and smoothly turned the tables whenever the hedgehog tried to pester him. He didn't hate the kid. Hell, he sometimes even genuinely enjoyed the kid's company back in their first tournament together. Almost ironically. He's happy enough with our unlikely friendship, thank you very much. But speaking of daily mandatory bonding, Sonic was just way too noisy for Snake's taste. He'd rather end another exhausting brawl-filled day by crawling into his cozy, heavenly bed than tiredly forcing himself to entertain an energetic chatterbox right before he could earn the beauty sleep he deserved. Snake might be an expert on giving the silent treatment, but he had his limits on enduring the kid's need of attention, too, mind you. Besides, if he slips one embarrassing move or accidentally reveals one precious possession nobody should ever lay their eyes on in front of the snickering hedgehog, he swore that chump saw his fluffy bunny socks, he's sure the news to spread like wildfire the next day. At least Snake predicted Sonic to behave as that kind of roommate. The choice could have been worse, anyway. Emphasis on literally stinking Wario or puppy mun puppy munching Ridley. Let's just hope he'd be able to survive by the end of this year's tournament season. Snake learned that having a roommate could be strangely interesting. Don't get him wrong, his assumption of Sonic the Hedgehog being the perfect example of a nosy, pesky roommate had been correct. Snake? Snake? Snakey! Snake? 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 Steak? Steak, 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 steak. What? Hi. The story doesn't end there, however. The more mornings and nights, and sometimes afternoons, they spent together, no matter how long each moment lasted and whether they like it or not, the more Snake noticed the tiny habits his companion absentmindedly does, like whistling his favorite tune whenever he lies down with his hands behind his head, tapping his foot whenever he impatiently waits for a reply, or adding tisk 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 whenever he playfully makes fun of his own roommate or just anyone. Not that Snake was being a creep or anything weird. It's just impossible for these trivial details that frequently happen to go unnoticed, that's all. Furthermore, he's sure the same goes for the kid, for the, he occasionally commented Snake's own habits like, Wake up! Faster hand you need your helping hand right now, so get your snorting ass out of there! And, For how long are you going to stare at that ceiling, mister? Wow, it's been an hour now. That's a record. Aren't you hungry? Being roommates for quite some time, Snake got to also witness the Sonic who drops the tough act more often. Staying away from their own world for several days meant triggering homesickness among the Smashers, and Sonic was no exception. As soon as Snake casually asked about his friends or past adventures, the kid's longing expression would melt away, replaced by a fond, innocent smile, wearing it all the way as he enthusiastically engages into a storytelling about how Snake reminded him of a certain grumpy baker, how he once embarked on a journey with his past self, how he and his friends once babysat a robot, and many more. Snake secretly adored this hidden side of his little friend. It reminded him of how much of a child Sonic still was, the fact that the kid wanted to push away like the teenager he was. Snake never expected Sonic to completely lower his guard down one night, or rather one early morning when fate randomly pulled Snake out of his peaceful slumber like it's the funniest act it ever did. A little too early to feel fresh from sleep, he inwardly groaned at the nasty prank the universe oh so excitedly tried out on his sorry ass. <sniffs> huh. Sonic with a runny nose again. With his love for the outside world and the wind, he's bound to get victimized this pollen season. <coughs> oh, well, 
That further confer- <laughs> Wait, what? Snake snapped his eyes open and faced the other side of their shared bedroom. Even through the nearly pitch-black room, only shown by the tiniest moonlight, he could still make out the lying figure of the hedgehog, fully covered in blanket. Snake remained stone still on his spot and stared intently, checking if those pitiful sounds were merely a part of his drowsy imagination. <sighs> okay, maybe not. Snake propped his elbow on his own mattress to examine the clothes lump, which shifted slightly. <clears throat> Sonic! Snake whispered in the dead of the night. He received another hiccup as a reply. Snake carefully pulled his own blanket away and sat on his own bed. Hey. The muffled sniffling and hiccuping halted like that voice alone switched off Sonic's own, but then it carried on more quietly in a failed attempt to silence itself. <laughs> Snake sighed. He stood up and cautiously approached the other bed. The nearer he walked towards the hiding kid, the deeper the stab of pity pierced through his heart. <sighs> Sonic. Hey, what's wrong? Sonic curled himself in a vein of effort to disappear and unintentionally let out a whimper. <laughs> Before Snake could think through his actions carefully, he gingerly settled himself on the edge of Sonic's bed for the first time since they shared room. Kid, it's okay. You don't have to keep everything to yourself. With those words... The tiny crying noises gradually died down into a heavy and almost uncomfortable silence. For a moment, Snake thought Sonic fell back asleep before the sudden rustling of the blanket broke the silence. When the hedgehog hesitantly revealed his blue quills and somber face, it took Snake's everything to hold himself back from hugging the kid. Sonic's pointed ears drooped low and his heavy-lidded eyes, red from rubbing it furiously, glistened by the tears previously shed for God knows how long. His lips pursed tightly, keeping it from trembling, but a quick coughing fit coursed its way out. Still avoiding eye contact, Sonic wiped his eyes with the blanket, sniffed loudly, and croaked. Snake, do dreams become real? Snake was taken aback by the unexpected question. What kind of dream did Sonic mean? The lifelong mission your pure five-year-old self set up for your fed-up twenty-five-year-old self to fulfill? or the fuzzy, peculiar visions you see in your sleep and forget in your wake. Determined not to keep the kid waiting, Snake settled with an answer that the word dream could mean both. Depends on how realistic it is. It could happen. Why do you ask? Sonic finally met Snake's gaze. Those green eyes, usual glint of snark and arrogance went missing tonight, were placed by an unfamiliar dullness. Lifelessness. And Snake didn't like it one bit. Snake snapped out of his trance when Sonic burst out half laughing and half sobbing as he brought the back of his gloveless hand up to cover his eyes. Well, this is stupid. Uh, I don't even remember everything. Ah, a literal dream, then. Snake frowned at how much the kid's pride drained away and how carelessly he exposed his vulnerable state. This wasn't Sonic, the most easygoing and carefree person Snake had probably ever met. Huh. So what do you remember, then? took another while before Sonic found his cracked voice again as he played the blanket with his fingers. There's a light, I think, and we're all there for some reason. Sonic gulped and shivered momentarily. Then the light, it wiped us all out, like it killed us. Damn. What kind of stress might the kid been hurtling to cause such a nightmare? Or did it pop out of his subconscious out of nowhere? Before Snake could say something, Sonic chuckled hoarsely, cut off by another cough. I, I don't know. And I, I think about it. If you put it that way, it does sound really dumb. But... Snake put a hand against his chest as if to check his rising heartbeat rate. I felt terrified back there. Snake hummed in understanding. He'd had countless similar experiences, too. So many that if the vague nightmares weren't so impactful, he'd grown bored of it. Every time he encountered a horrible one, he'd involuntarily jolt up from his slumbering place, gasping for breath, for the terror felt too real to ignore and forget. Poor kid. Snake, I I'm scared. Huh? Scared? W what if we all died for real, like in the dream? I mean, okay, I know we fought a lot of things and narrowly escaped from death so many times, but, but what if we didn't make it this time, like in the subspace incident? What if we all became helpless again? 
when I got the letter, I was too dense to consider becoming a smasher. I didn't know the multiverse was in danger while I haven't responded. I could have been a whole lot more helpful and I accepted the had I accepted the invitation sooner, but no. I came to the party late when everyone was about to die just because I thought I was better off without you guys. Pathetic. It's only luck that I freaking wanted we all lived, even though I was actually scared like hell when I fought Taboo. Uh, if I didn't come, y'all would be seriously doomed, and it would be all my fault. At this point, a fresh wave of tears overcame Sonic, and his uncharacteristic stuttering worsened. Kid. But what if uh, next time it happens, I'll turn a blind eye again? I don't want you guys to die. What if I'm too late? Pat. Sonic flinched upon the startling, yet gentle contact. Snake wordlessly stroked the hedgehog's soft head. Sonic, on the other hand, lay stiffly under the blanket. If it weren't for his blubbery rambling and the overwhelming emotion circling inside him, he'd undoubtedly glare at the man above him for what he was doing and maybe swat his hand away. This time, he didn't complain, and eventually relaxed against the touch. Still, the kid continued to weep as he shakily brushed away every teardrop that fell. Snake focused on scratching the hedgehog's ear as he recovered from the shock of watching Sonic breaking down. Seeing the normally proud kid, who always trusted himself and believed in others, worry immensely and cry that hard, it kind of freaked Snake out. Of course he knew the kid had his weak moments, too. He just never gave it much thought before. Not like this. When the tears ran out and the hedgehog's breathing pattern was set back to normal, Snake couldn't help but chuckle. Sonic, it's just a dream. When I said it could happen, like maybe only 10% of what we've seen does come true. That one you have? It can't be that one. Sonic owlishly blinked up on Snake who fleetingly thought that that was the cutest move the kid had ever done. He ruffled the hedgehog's head slightly faster and smirked. We're Smash Brothers. We defeated Taboo and saved the multiverse together. Now that we're all 70 and counting, can anything worse still stop us? Sonic stared with a rare, meek expression and did the first sign he found comfort from his roommate that night. He giggled. <laughs> yeah. Don't forget, Snake gently said. What matters is the end. We made it all alive because of you, Sonic. We've never been more grateful for your arrival. You're the reason why we survived and saved the universe. Sonic's lips quivered. His eyes shone anew, and he wiped it as he gave off a particularly loud sob. But, but... Snake sighed. No, it's not your fault if we... But, Sonic... It's not your fault if we did fail. You weren't informed about the incident from the beginning, so we shouldn't blame you, whether you wanted to come or not. It's only your fault if you happen to side with Taboo, but the blue blur I know won't let the world crumble, yeah? Sonic opened his mouth, only to get interrupted by another coughing fit. Besides, Snake added, scratching Sonic's other ear, you're not the only one who initially didn't want to be a smasher. I was worse even, remember? The comment stirred the kid from protesting to ask. The comment stirred the kid from protesting to asking. How come you came? Snake shrugged. My friends pushed me to come. Sonic hummed and lowered his gaze. Another pause followed till Sonic said in a small voice, uh, I still should have come sooner, though. Snake stops ruffling the hedgehog's head and stared down his roommate. He then distantly looked out the window displaying the indigo sky littered with tinkling stars. To be completely honest, if you arrived too soon, you'd be too exhausted to destroy Tabby's wings. If that's the case, we'd be perished to dust two years ago. We can't be reunited like this anymore. You could say that you were somewhat our miracle back then. At first, Sonic said nothing and remained motionless, barely reacting to Snake's stroking hand. His eyelids then slowly rose as if realization dawned on him. Contrasting his low spirits minutes ago, the kid stifled a giggle, but soon let any restraints go and genuinely laughed, which made Snake retract his hand from the hedgehog's shaking head. I guess being late has its perks, too. Snake smiled down at the merry hedgehog, relieved and glad that the kid finally lightened up from his unsettling anxiety. Now that's more like it. Sonic laughed a little more while it, while 
until it faded into a relaxed smile that lingered on even when Snake placed a hand on the kid's head again and resumed petting the hedgehog. That was not necessary. Why couldn't he help it? Neither uttered another word, and both stayed like that. The silence was strangely bearable, one that Snake found solace from, even around the most annoying smasher in the household, and might perhaps be the most comfortable one ever since both smashers shared a room. No longer distressed, Zonk spoke up. That was really weird. Snake raised a brow. What is? Zonk coughed. Me, crying over a nightmare. He smiled sadly. Guess I worry a lot more than I... Guess I worry I lot more than I let on. Even if we're basically unstoppable, the thought of getting killed still kind of haunts me, you know? The hedgehog vocally sighed. I just love you guys. Aw. What a confession. Shush. Snake huffed at the kid's default attitude coming to play, though he didn't find it eye-rolling this time. You okay now? Instead of using the automatic reply, Are you kidding? Of course I'm fine, cause I'm Sonic! He nodded dismissively. Yeah, yeah. Snake patted Sonic one last time before he finally withdrew his hand. Sleep now. Don't worry. You'll see everyone safe and sound tomorrow. Unless another room blows up. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Snake tapped on Sonic's nose. Oi! Sonic barked and groaned as he rubbed his pointed hedgehog nose, said, Night, kid, and stood up. Hey, Snake! Huh? Sonic did what Snake thought the prideful smasher would never do for the life of him. Hug, Snake. Sonic said nothing as he held his smashed brother, who was too stunned to react by the sudden display of affection. When Snake looked down on the hedgehog, hiding his face, he realized that, no, Sonic wasn't just a bright hero of Mobius and the multiverse, nor was he also just a fun-loving fellow who enjoys teasing and playing with his friends and family and value the people's safety above all else. Sonic is also just a teenager who will not only take advantage of the title, young adult, to feel more superior than necessary, but became more confused and doubtful about plenty of things including their capabilities in the future, plus be annoyingly denial of the need to reach out a guiding hand from a more mature and a wiser grown-up. He really is still just a child. Thanks, came the muffled voice of Sonic, who quickly sniffed. Then the kid looked up, pouting, and muttered, And don't you dare tell anyone about this, got it? Snake grinned. Says the hedgehog who loves giving free hugs. What happened to that? Snake! Super Smash Brothers, Bedwetter's Cabin, by Sweet Sativa. Inkling Boy has been traumatized by the giant, flaming Smash Brothers logo being burned into his retina. Every night he dreams of it and ends up inking his bed. Upon meeting up with his fellow young fighters, he finds out that he's not the only Nintendo character with problems staying dry. Contains diapers, bedwetting, omurashi. I don't want to know what that last one is. Summary Inkling Boy's dreams are haunted by the day he learned he would be in the new Super Smash Brothers. The giant flaming ring logo of the game burns bright in his nightmares and causes him to ink the bed nearly every night. Notice The scene referred to in this story is from the Inkling reveal of Super Smash Brothers Ultimate. I tried to describe it, but you may want to find it on YouTube. The Inkling Boy was running, grin on his face and shooter in his hands. His opponent, Inkling Girl, threw a splat bomb at him. He hardly hesitated as he converged to his squid form and dove into the blue ink. The two ran in circles, the blue Inkling Boy and orange Inkling Girl trading shots in their friendly battle. Suddenly, everything went black. Inkling Boy saw his friend stop running and stare into the horizon. He followed her gaze and saw it, a colossus flaming ring with crosshairs in its center. Below it stood some of the fiercest beasts Inkling Boy could imagine. Dragons, magical warriors, great apes, gods, and more. He could do nothing but stare into them, letting it imprint itself on his eyeballs. He was paralyzed in fear, eclipsed by the flame. Inkling Boy shot up straight in his bed, his body dripping with sweat. He was breathing heavily and shivering softly. Just that dream again, he thought to himself, getting his bearings. He looked around the dark hotel room and saw his friend, Inkling Girl, still fast asleep in the next bed over. 
he gently lifted his covers up to do a check and slid his sleep shorts down a little. It was dark, but he could still make out the blue tent coming from his diaper. He sighed. Damn it! Make my bed again, he thought. He moved a hand down to feel the damage. His cloth-backed disposable diaper was still warm, and it had swollen considerably. Inkling Boy wiggled his butt a little to see if he still even needed to pee. Nope, the dream scared all the ink right out of him. This has been a nightly occurrence ever since the scene played out on that fateful day when Nintendo drafted them for Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. Him and Inkling Girl skirmaging, not a care in the world, then suddenly, BAM! He's being confronted by some of the strongest beings in the universe. And that giant, flaming ring. It burned bright in his eyes, torching any thought of safety he had in his mind. He recalled staring at that ring for what must have only been seconds, but felt like hours. He only snapped out of it when Inkling Girl stepped directly in front of him, blocking his vision. Hey, you all right? She asked. Y yeah, he said, trying to put on a tough face and pretend he wasn't afraid. I'm just excited we finally get to be in Smash Bros. He remembered Inkling Girl laughing and pointing down at his shorts. You look excited, she said, doubling up from laughter. He looked down and saw his dark shorts were wet in the front, and blue ink had stained his thighs and flowed down into his shoes, which were now standing in a sizable blue puddle. He put his arms over his crotch, trying to cover up as much of the wet spot as he could. He hadn't even noticed he was inking himself at the time. Since then, nearly every night was the same dream. The scrimmage, the fire, the fighters, the wet bed. For the first few months, he had resorted to washing his sheets each night, but the blue ink had left a permanent stain in them. He was forced to result to diapers. Now, in his dark hotel room, he was forced to confront his second worst fear. He wasn't going to stop inking the bed before the game began. Tomorrow, he and Inkling Girl would leave the hotel and take a car to the Smash Brothers estate, where he will have to share a room with other competitors he'd never met before. But for now, he was faced with a wet diaper and a decision. Should he change into a fresh diaper and risk waking Inkling Girl, or should he just go back to sleep, damp? Inkling Boy laid his head back onto his pillow. The two of them were going to have a long day tomorrow. He needed sleep more than he needed to be dry. Nintendo Chronicles by Rare Roar what are you willing to do to protect the people you care about? To what lengths will you go to make tomorrow better than today? Strangers caught in a race for power have their lives changed forever, and destinies become entwined as gaming's greatest family starts to form. This is the story of how the first few characters of Nintendo came together to save their world. Chapter 2 The Genesis Flatbush, Brooklyn, New York the early morning sun gave light to the city streets. The early breeze rustled the trees along the sidewalks. Dressed in a white t-shirt and jeans, a short man let his arm out of the window as he drove down the street. Spring air flowing through his hair as he surveyed the area. He had just acquired the basement floor of an apartment from the bank. It would be the start of his new empire. If he could find it first. Soon enough, he did. 3891 Miyamoto Avenue. Well, here it is. Mario Brothers Plumbing. He looked out the window of his U-Haul truck at the dusty old apartment. Crushing leaves, cigarettes, and newspapers under his feet, he got out his key and opened the door. Let's see what's inside. The inside was crawling with animals, both the living and dead. The ones able-bodied instantly retreated from morning sun's rays back into the many nooks, crannies, and holes of the apartment, while the corpses of the rest, completely slathered in ants, finally showed the light their grim stepped back the smell absolutely overwhelming him. He spat out on the sidewalk. Mamma mia, that's nasty. To think I paid for that. Coughing and spitting all over the street, he walked over to a payphone. Putting in his quarters and dialing the number, he waited as the phone rang, praying his brother wasn't asleep. Come on, pick up. Come on, pick up, pick up. Hello? A groggy voice came from across the phone. Luigi, it's me. I'm at the place. M Mario, you're where? I'm at the apartment fan. Get with the program. Bro, it's 6.10 in the morning. The city is just putting on its morning cup of coffee and making the kids pancakes. I wanted to get a head start. It turns out we're going to need it. This place is an absolute dump. 
Now, I thought this ad said it was fit for use. Well, other than the biohazard that's inside, it's perfectly fit for use. You don't have to be sarcastic. Mom and Pop are still asleep. Well, then you better be quiet getting all the stuff we need out of the house. What are we going to need? A mop and a few scrubbing pads? Anything that deals with cleaning and sanitation. He gave the place another glance. Scratch that. Everything that deals with cleaning and sanitation. Are you serious? How long is it going to take? Well, it's not so big a place, but to clean it all up and place all our stuff between the two of us, uh, ten hours? What about the next game at 2.30? Ten hours? Are you serious? Yeah. Guess that means you better drag your butt over here then, huh? Can't we just hire a cleaning service? Luigi protested. With the what money? Mom's just going to say that we need to take care of ourselves, and Dad will say that we are better off just working for him. You know, working for Dad wouldn't mean we have to do all this. All right, Luigi. You can go work for Dad in the kitchen. I even have a pizza in mind that you can do. The No Future Special. The first ingredient is to take a college application, shred that up, and use it as the cheese. Then you take your tears. That's going to be the delicious sauce. Yum, yum, yum. So salty. The dough will be your hopes and dreams that we pound and throw around until it's flattened for good. Now, bake it in the oven of shame, lost hopes, and broken dreams you call a heart for 35 years. Take it out, make sure it's nice and flat like your income, then shove it sideways up your candy ass. Now I get the point, Luigi harshly responded. If you freeze it and save leftovers, you can give it to your own son, Luigi Jr., Mario added. Okay, I'm coming. I'll be there in about an hour. Luigi let out a groan, accepting his fate. Good, and since you are being such a good sport, I'll let you pick out the air freshener. Lemon or pine? Mario leaned against the wall, waiting for his brother to come. Out of the corner of his eye, he spotted three familiar figures. Oh boy, here we go, Mario muttered under his breath as they approached. Mario, the one in front said, flicking away his stoogie. What are you doing up so early in the morning? His egg head starting to shine in the sun. Vito, my man, I was just waiting for Luigi so we can start setting up our place. It started the best start, you know. Truth in that. So what's it like on the inside? Vito took a step forward to inspect. Mario grabbed his arm. Whoa, Betty, trust me, you want to stay in the safe zone. It's a mess now, but give it time and it'll be the best plumbing company around. Plumbing company, eh? Vito pondered it for a second. Ain't you breaking off the family tradition of being a chef like your old man? Trying to. I can always crawl back to him if the plumbing thing goes under. You know, you can use some protection when- Save it, Vito. I'm not interested, Mario said, leaning back on the telephone pole. Well, I'm sorry you feel that way, Mario, Vito said. But you know, it would be a damn shame if something were to happen here, you know? Mario chuckled. Really, Vito? Are you trying to run roughshod over me? I thought our families were on friendlier terms than that. Let's not forget that your dad stayed at the pizza parlor for a month when things got dicey a while back. I could have sworn your father said our family was off limits forever. He paced around. Speaking of your father, he would be very disappointed if I told him about your special friends, wouldn't he? I'm not talking about the boys behind you. But you know who I mean. Vito took a step back, stunned. Then he started growling. I thought you were better than that, Mario. Hey, I don't make the rules. I just play the game. Mario raised his hands. I won't say anything if you just back off. You were the one who came over here trying to push on me. Why don't we all just stay cool here? Luigi pulled up from down the street. Hey, Mario! He honked his horn. Over here! Perfect timing, Mario thought, waving Luigi over. Luigi, come here. You still got those Knicks tickets? I keep them in my pocket, so I always know where they are, his brother responded with pride. Mind if I see them? I just want to make sure they aren't damaged. Okay, sure. Luigi politely handed them over. Mario took them and turned right back to Vito. If you help me get this place set up, free tickets to the Knicks game. Court side. Vito raised an eyebrow. How the hell did you two saps get courtside tickets to the Knicks in the playoffs? Luigi.
need you on a radio contact. Don't ask what it was about. Mario waved the tickets in front of Vito's face. So, we got a deal? Vito snatched the tickets out of Mario's hand. Deal. Mario turned back to a stunned Luigi. You can yell at me later. Right now, get some rubber gloves and a broom. It is not creepy in there. Mario sat on his couch, watching the Knicks game. Off court side, but I'll take it. I ought to smack you in the head with this ladle, Luigi shouted from the kitchen. Who you could go around and give them the tickets? I won! First of all, it got Vito and his boys off of our back for now. Second of all, they did good work. We got the place cleaned out, put in all of our equipment, moved the furniture, and installed cable and plumbing in here. All in six hours. We'd still be working if it wasn't for them. A basketball game isn't our top priority right now. We got to get off to a good start. Mario heard Luigi grumble behind him. I hate it when you're right. You can thank me by getting me another bowl of spaghetti, Mario said. Besides, you can always win another radio contest. How did you know Madonna's 15 most popular hits in order? There was a knock on the door. I'll get it, Mario said. Walking over, he recognized the figure outside. A big grin emerged on his face as he opened the door. Pauline, sweetheart, come on in. A young woman wearing a red shirt and jeans came in, holding a white box. Hey, Mario, good to see you too. She waved at his brother. Hi, Luigi. Pauline looked around the apartment. Wow, the place looks great. Glad you got everything set up in a day. That must have took some work. Mario waved it off. Oh, it wasn't too much work. My Knicks tickets could sure validate that, Luigi snapped. That's because I'm a man of good business. I know how to get things done. He leaned on the counter. So, what can I do for ya, Miss Pauline Lady? She set the box down. I bought this cake as a housewarming gift. It's chocolate. My favorite! Mario opened the box, a big grin coming to his face as he looked inside. Pauling, it's huge! Thank you so much! Luigi, get the knife and paper plates. This is gonna be awesome! Actually, I gotta go. My shift at the diner starts in a few minutes. Just came to say hi. She gave Mario a kiss on the cheek and walked back out. How come you got a girlfriend after graduation and I didn't? Luigi asked bitterly, cutting out a slice of cake. If you try actually talking to them, you could get one, Mario responded. He raised his fork. A toast. To our new lives as plumbers? To our new lives as plumbers. However long this lasts, Luigi said back. I'll take it. Think. Daisy's Soaking Bar Time by Petsky Plumber while Luigi becomes disgusted with Princess Daisy peeing herself. Supernatural Drama While Luigi was watching Daisy drinking a lot of lemonade, making him rub his chin as he was sitting next to her at a counter. What's with you, Princess? Do you like yellow that much? Well, Luigi commented as he held a lemon in his right hand. You could say that, yeah! Daisy exclaimed after letting out a huge burp, slamming the empty glass on the counter as she crossed he legs. Oh, I really gotta go pee! Thanks for sharing with the class, Waluigi remarked in a sarcastic tone as he chucked away the lemon. Why can't you just go do your business without announcing it to the world? Waluigi was cut short by Daisy peeing herself, with the lanky purple man being disgusted as Daisy let out a huge sigh of relief as she giggled. Ah, now that's refreshing, Daisy exclaimed as she felt happy to have her dress soaked, soaked in her urine, turning to Waluigi. Now I get to be even more yellow. That? Is so disgusting, I don't even know how to have a response to that, Waluigi remarked as he just shook his head, adjusting his cap as he moved his stool away from the peeing princess. Is this your kink or something? No, I just like going to the bathroom anywhere that I feel like, Daisy responded as she slammed her hand on the desk, peeing herself some more. She screamed, Hey, where can a girl get some more lemonade? Sheesh, you need to lay off the drinks if you're going to be wetting yourself. I don't need your sympathy, Daisy scoffed as she slammed both of her fists on the counter, getting impatient. I want more to drink. I demand it as a princess. Waluigi huffed as he twirled his mustache around. And you wonder why some people don't want to be around you. Come on, I need to let it all out after holding it in from all those battles, Daisy responded as she brushed back her brown hair. You would understand if you were playable, but you're not, so you don't.
I wouldn't be so cocky if I were you. You barely got in as an echo, pointed out as he moved past the two. While Luigi had a confident smirk as he nodded his head in appreciation, he has a good point. Shut up! Assist trophies don't get to gloat! Daisy responded as she grabbed Waluigi by his overalls, glaring right into his face. I bet they wouldn't even consider you for the base game like last time. Waluigi coughed as Daisy smelled from her pee soaking up her damp dress. Backwards Long Jump the Stairs by Pesky Plumber Performing a backward long jump takes more effort than it seems. Hey Mario! How do you do the backward long jump? Ness asked as he and Captain Falcon walked up to the plumber who was sitting on a bench in the hallway. Oh, well it's easy. You just have to position yourself and scream Yahoo! a lot. Mario explained as he went to the nearby red staircase and proceeded to do as such, going up it at a high speed. Captain Falcon chuckled as he patted Ness on the back. See, kid? It's easy. Mario showed us the way. Ness was a bit nervous as he attempted it, but it didn't do much. Captain Falcon smirked as he then tried it himself, but it wasn't going as well. Both of them looked at each other as they glanced up at Mario, who shrugged. Of course you chumps wouldn't know how to do it. Ness and Captain Falcon were shocked that Waluigi was the one telling them this, who proceeded to pull off the BLJ as he screamed, Wah! instead. Waluigi then folded his lanky arms together as he laughed, while Mario rubbed the back of his head, with both Ness and Captain Falcon feeling crappy for not being able to do it. Waluigi's Realization By the Mayan Waluigi realizes that it's not easy to be in his spot. Waluigi sighed as he looked at the spot on the assist trophy roster for which he was a part of, looking at the billboard on the wall within a hallway in the mansion as he murmured, looking at his purple tennis racket as he shook his head. Being that he was arguably the most popular of the non-playable characters, it put a lot of pressure on him to realize that he could possibly never get his chance through the, due to the unfortunate circumstances of being Waluigi. Why do I always bother to agree being like this every game? Waluigi muttered as he sighed and placed away his tennis racket. Maybe I'm just not fit to be a fighter. Hey, don't feel too bad. You got it better than most, Shadow the Hedgehog said as he walked by while drinking some Dr. Pepper. Waluigi squinted his eyes at Shadow as he pointed at the black and red hedgehog. Don't you feel cheated out of being like this too? Shadow murmured as he looked down closing his eyes and nodding his head. Sometimes. Waluigi cocked. Then why are you willing to let it go? Because there's worse positions you could be in, Shadow concluded as he patted Waluigi on the back and took his leave. Waluigi thought about this as he decided to leave the billboard as well, heading in the other direction as a bunch of piranha plants were popping out of the ground, trying to get his attention. Waluigi simply ignored them as he continued his way, making the plants sad that their idol didn't recognize them. Being neglected again, yet I'm in a better position than most, Waluigi grumbled to himself as he looked up to see Petey Piranha selling popcorn, adjusting his purple cap. Hey, Parlor Pete, how do you feel about being a lame boss assist reused as a final smash? Petey munched through some of the buttery popcorn he didn't sell as he simply shrugged, with Waluigi taken aback at how fine the mutant plant was, was with his predicament. If he's fried with this, then I guess being non-playable isn't so bad, Waluigi said in a tone so quiet no one around him was able to hear, with a tall, lanky man entering one of the various lobbies as everyone involved with Smash Brothers as communicating with each other, most of them being spirits. Is Waluigi still moody about being an assist trophy again? Mouser asked as he watched Waluigi go by while sitting on the couch. Silver the Hedgehog shrugged as he was eating a slice of honey-topped pizza. I can't blame him for being disappointed. I know how it feels to just be a background element. Waluigi continued his way through as he entered the outdoor garden, seeing Dry Bowser's legendary burger stand as he noticed the reptile selling some of his bone-enhancing hamburgers. Oh, hey, Waluigi, are you in need of one of my legend burgers? Dry Bowser spoke up as the flame didn't face him due to his fire-resistant nature to it. I got these near the reset bomb forest. That nightmare is a real battlefield, let me tell you. But it does have its quirks. 
while Luigi placed his hands on his hips as he smeared. And why would I want that? Because you're in one of your moods again, Dry Bowser pointed out as he flipped some of the patties he had on his grill. Maybe you just need a higher jump in your gut to feel better. Waluigi rolled his eyes. Just what I need. Encourage it, but f encouragement from Bowser Bone. Dry Bowser's eyes turned blue as he clenched his right fist. Look, do you want my juicy burgers or not? Maybe no, because I don't feel the need to have them. In fact, I reject them. Waluigi spat back as he pointed forward. And what are you going to do about it? Dry Bowser then zapped at Waluigi with a quick electrical jolt, then chucked one of his fragile bones at his face. I'll do much worse if you don't get out of the way, Dry Bowser warned as he noticed some people heading his way. I'm sure my fellow spirits are more interested than someone of higher stature such as yourself. Bah! Rabbit Peach snapped as she was getting impatient, pushing Waluigi out of the way as she wanted her burger, waving to Dry Bowser as she was good friends with him. Waluigi couldn't believe how willingly Dry Bowser was to the rabbit, seeing them have good chemistry with each other as he proceeded to sulk away, with Little Mac and Isabel watching from a wooden bench as they were having McDonald's. Oh my, poor Waluigi really doesn't see the value in being an assist, does he? Isabel said while having some french fries. Little Mac was too busy stuffing Big Macs into his mouth as he glanced at the cute dog secretary next to him. He shouldn't complain, he gets to be playable in all sorts of games compared to us. Waluigi turned his head to the duo as he snarled at them, making Isabel hide behind the bench as Little Mac stuffed another burger down his maw. Feeling that they wouldn't be worth the effort, Waluigi shook his head as he continued on, until he bumped into Charizard, who was lightning, who was lighting some sticks on fire to bring more light to the garden. So, I take it that being a Pokemon Pokemon wasn't all that bad, Waluigi, Waluigi spoke up as he folded his arms. Charizard glanced down at Waluigi as he nodded his head, the fire-flying-type dragon-like Pokemon continuing to fire up the sticks as he mumbled a response to Waluigi afterwards. So you were just grateful that they even considered you over many other Pokemon? Waluigi pieced together as he murmured, rubbing his chin as he shook his head. You know, perhaps you raise a good point. After taking in some consideration, Waluigi continued on his way as Charizard's grunts were apparent enough to soothe the skinny, dastardly man, for reasons quite unknown to virtually anyone else. We Fit Trainers Farting Problem By Yoshizilla Redosaurus We Fit Trainer joins the Super Smash Brothers for when the gassy monarch Princess Peach Toadstool and says she's a better farter. Why? Just why? <laughs> what? Why? Why eighty-three? Why eighty-three chapters? Does this guy? Did this guy write it? And are they all? Are are they all farting? Or are they? What is this? Pauline farting because a certain Odyssey came and made her made her more beautiful than before. Godzilla is 64 years old. Appropriately, the King of the Monsters gets a legendary man 64 to commemorate it. Space Ghost. Silhouette, farting. Space Ghost. Pokemon. Banjo-Kazooie. 